Hi, I am Mrs. Sloan, and this is a continuation from our um, chapter 26 on um, flowering plants and control of growth responses. Video one did an overview of signal transduction and the major hormones that plants have in order to coordinate their response to their environment. So we're gonna continue on with this, and we are going to be focusing on uh, plant growth and movements and response to light um, and seasons. And so if you are new to my videos, um, there are notes listed down at the bottom um, that you can use that go along with this presentation. All right. So I encourage you to have watched uh, video one uh, first uh, in this because uh, it would give you a, a better understanding of what we're going to talk about today on plant growth movement and responses. All right, here we go. So um, first of all, we talked about this before, just like, let me move this up away. We talked about this before about phototropism and we talked about primarily about oxen and its role in that. And phototropism in essence is just when a plant grows towards the light, okay? In response to light in some way. Um, gravitropism is a response to gravity and thigmotropism is a response uh, to touch. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a, in a minute, but on your introduction, um, 26.2 in your notes, um, plant growth and movement responses. Movement to stimulus can be internal, like turgor pressure, uh, electrical impulses or hormones. It could be external, um, responses to light or response to water. So a tropism, and you have the definition right here on your screen, is growth responses toward or away from a unidirectional external stimuli, unidirectional external stimuli. Turger movements are responses to internal stimuli, to internal stimuli, all right? And we will focus first on phototropism, and this is plant's ability to respond either positively towards the light or negatively away from that stimuli. And phototropism is positive in shoots, and either neutral or negative in roots. So towards the light um, in shoots, negative or neutral in roots. It makes sense that the roots would grow a, away from the light. So how does this work? Um, to control this response, this phototropism, there are things called phototropins. So a receptor is a phototropin that becomes phosphorylated. So we've talked about that before, right? Phosphorylation activating it. So a phototropin is a light sensitive pigment. And what this pigment does is to help maximize the plant's ability to acquire light, right? To follow the sun maybe throughout the day. So you have that in your notes, the receptor is phototropism that becomes phosphorylated, okay? Um, next, um, if you look, this is a little reminder about how we have seen this in action, and this causes then oxen to move to the shady side of the plant. And remember through acid growth hypothesis, then those cells on the shady side of the plant, they have a weakened cell wall, which then when water moves into the vacuoles causes those cell walls to stretch and then bend it towards the, the sun. All right. Okay. Um, thigmotropism. Thigmotropism is a response to contact with another object, which would cause, like, for instance, this plant to wind around this support pole. You can see how that would be advantageous for the plant, right? Because if you don't have a lot of secondarily thickened walls, then you're hanging on to something to allow you to get up higher than all the other plants to get your leaves up there so you can expose them to the sun, okay? Um, there are other types of, um, uh, thigmotropisms that you see, like this is, uh, I think this is a sun, sun, not sun, sundew plant. Yeah, sundew plant, where when the insect, um, touches on the edge of the plant, then it then wraps around that plant. And this is usually a, a plant that grows in nitrogen deficient soil. So it's going to get its nitrogen from that plant. You see the same thing in a Venus flytrap with sensitive hairs, right? That cause that plant to respond. So, Thigmomorphogenesis is a is a larger concept that you would see like maybe some some cypress plants or some oak trees on the top of a real windy area and it, it's like they're bracing themselves against the wind. So um, on 
thigmotropism or thigmomorphogenesis you want to have when the whole plant changes its shape like short thick trunk of a tree in a windy location so thigmomorphogenesis is when the whole plant changes and i don't think i gave you everything about thigmotropism in a and b so let me go back to that sorry about that thigmotropism is a response to contact with another object um, cells on the opposite side elongate and B, if touched in the dark, they will respond when there is light. Okay, they can respond when there is light. And the reason is they need ATP. So for instance, if they're touching and it's dark, they can't respond right then because they're going to need some ATP in order to have that movement of the auxin and also then to have those plants, the the part that's touched, they're, they're going to stay right there. And the part that's not touched, that's going to be the part that elongates and around. Okay, here you can see um, shoots responding um, with positively to gravitropism. So gravitropism is negative in shoots and positive in roots. Um, so hopefully I said that right just a minute ago. So shoots, it's going to be negative to gravity because they're going to grow away from gravity, whereas shoots are going to go towards gravity, positive in the roots, negative in the shoots. I probably messed that up and I really apologize. So in roots, there are organelles called amnioplasts. And let me see, I think I have a picture here again, gravitropism, okay, amnioplasts. And these contain little statilis, which settle to the bottom with gravity and signal that downward growth. So that's how they detect that, all right? And then um, next, okay, here you can see it's um, gravitropism right? Gravitropism would be negative in shoots, and it would be positive phototropism, right? Um, and then um, if we could see the roots, you could see that they were growing down. All right, so uh, nastic movements. I always think of nastic like spastic movements. And this would be like if you touch a planet and immediately the leaves close, why would that be adaptive? Because if there was some little herbivore crawling on it, if they can close their leaves, maybe there's not enough surface area for that herbivore to continue and they would be falling off. And then this is like called the prayer plant where it closes its leaves as at night. So on movement caused by internal stimuli, Introduction nastic movements when cells swell due to trigger pressure. Um, trigger responses to touch, it can be a result of touch, shaking, or thermal stimulation. Leaves can fold within a second to shake off a munching insect or close on a fly, and it may be some sort of electrical mechanism. Electrical mechanism. Okay, um, next. Um, this is our last topic for this chapter, right? Plant responses with a phytochrome. So remember auxin's jobs, right? Phototropism, gravitropism, apical dominance, seed development, and then thigmotropism, which we just talked about, okay? So photoperiodism, when you see that, and it's a little bit, it's, if you skip down, um, here, let me fill you in on your notes, so sorry. I'm a little tired this morning. Um, on your introduction, plants are aware of light. Plants are aware of light, okay? So they can sense the time of day, Okay, the amount of light and adjust their metabolic processes such as photosynthesis, right? Because you're going to want to have that active when there is light. And they can sense also the time of year affecting seasonal responses such as flowering. So it's dependent on the wavelengths of light um, using a phototropin that, phototropin that we discussed earlier and phyto, phytochromes. So a phytochrome is a pigment that acts like a switch that can initiate the response to light. Phytochromes help plants to tell time, okay? To help plants tell time. And then their response to that is called photoperiodism. So this is the physiological response to the light in a 24 hour, hour period. Phytochromes can also help in larger than a 24 hour period in seasons as well. So underneath phytochrome on the introduction, I talked to you about being a blue green pigment found in the cytoplasm. It can act as a switch and on and off and can detect Detect light and initiate a signal transduction pathway and initiate a signal transduction um, pathway. And then um, let's talk about and then let's talk about how it goes about doing this. OK, so this is pretty cool. All right. So this phytochrome, there's an inactive state and an active state. And the cool thing is, is that the inactive state, as the sun shines, as you get this far red light shining, it changes it from its inactive arrangement 
to an active state, okay? So it moves from P PR to PFR, which then it increases as the day progresses, changing more to PFR. Then when you have lack of light, it then goes back and changes a little metabolic conversion in the absence of light back to its inactive state. So by having a ratio between how much is active and inactive, that's how the plant can tell time. Okay, because the longer light is exposed, right, you will have more of the active form, right? And then during the night, you'll have less of that active form. So on your notes, go down to introduction C, can distinguish between red wavelengths and inner interconvert. So the inactive P PR absorbs red light and becomes active PFR. PFR absorbs the far red light in the evening and converts and converts back to PR. Okay, or darkness will do that. So how can plants use this switch to, to, um, to get a appropriate metabolic response to that light? Well, you have plants, uh, let's talk about photoperiodism. So flowering and photoperiodism. And photoperiod, photoperiodism, I have that definition for you, is a physiological response due to light in a 24-hour period. So you have some plants which are referred to as short day plants. Now, let me just tell you, what scientists didn't originally realize is they thought that some plants would flower when there is a short day, but really it's not how short the day is, it's how long the night is. But if you go and look at plants at like Home Depot, they still identify them as short day and long day plants, but short day plants really mean that you have a long night, that would be more like in winter, right? Whereas if you have a long day plant, that means you have a short night and that would be in the summer is when they would flower. So take a look right here. So within, this is a cockleburr, which is a short day plant, which would be more of a winter, a winter type plant. And go down in your notes, this would be little letter I underneath functions of phytochrome. Short day means you have a long night and they need a long night in order to flower, a critical amount of nightness, right, in order to flower. So here you can see they had a long enough night so these plants would flower. So I'm just asking you to predict, looking at this, would these plants flower? And would these plants flower? Okay, you got your prediction? All right, so let me show you how it works out. These plants are not gonna flower because their night was not long enough and they are a long night plant. Now, when you look at these plants, they're not flowering either because it has to be a continuous amount of light. And when they get interrupted like this by a flash of light in the middle of the night, then it doesn't count because it wasn't a continuous amount. Because right, if you get that flash of light, that light is gonna start changing that PR to PFR. And so they will not have clocked in a long night. So let's look at an example of a um, long day plan. So predict what you think is gonna happen in each of these scenarios. So if you, have a if you have a long day plan, you are gonna require a very short night. So if you look right here, what do you think is gonna happen for these plants? What do you think is gonna happen for these plants? And how about here? All right, let's see how you did. So yes, they got their short night, so they flowered. They did not get their short night, so they did not flower. And these, even though there was a whole bunch of night, remember, same thing we learned before, they got it interrupted with a flash of light. So they have some of that PR converting to PFR. So they ended up, they didn't have a continuous long night like you saw in this second scenario. So they in fact will flower. So on long day, you need a short night and there is a maximum number of critical hours uh, or night hours for them to flower. You can't go over that critical length. And then day neutral plants um, like tomatoes, yes, are day neutral plants so it's not dependent on the length of the night so and then I gave you the notes there that flashes of light can interrupt a long night and end up making it a short night all right so then let's relate this to seed germination so on you have most of the notes here but different seeds have different light requirements for for seed germination um, photomorphogenesis is when shoots are exposed to red light 
um, accumulating that PFR, that active form, and extend their leaves and become green. And I think I have a picture right here. Okay. And so let me move myself up here. So these are plant adaptations for going in the dark. So you can see they have these real pale stems. There's no, if you're in the dark, there is no point, right, in having, investing in that chlorophyll and being green. They're just focusing, trying to get that upward growth. Um, if you're etiolated, the shoot increases in length, but no photomorphogenesis because plant grow, plants are grown in the dark. And you see examples of that in the market, like with white asparagus and alfalfa sprouts. They're just like, we got to grow up because somewhere up there, there's got to be some light, right? Okay, next. Um, oh, here, phytochrome and competition. I'm trying to see if I gave you, uh, yes, competition. So plants grown closer together experience more far red light. They experience more shade. And so that encourages them, if they're getting more shade due to the neighboring plants, then they focus their growth upward um, so they can outcompete the other plants. Okay, so plants grown closer together experience more far red light and shade. These plants grow taller in order to compete better and to receive more light. Okay, and then next about circadian rhythms. Now you have circadian rhythms, right? Your response to uh, your normal patterns of when you wake, when you sleep, when you're hungry, all of those types of things. And plants have circadian rhythms as well. And so this is a, a metabolic process or cycle um, where you have high and low activity during a 24 hour period regardless of the light those plants will respond just like you you even if you travel you want you end up waking up at the same time you always wake up and it can be reset due to amount of light so just like you if you travel um, and you go to the east coast when you live on the west coast you will adapt to the change in the light um, but it'll take a little bit of time right so examples in plants is stomata opening in the morning um, nectar secreting at the same time every time and leaves closing at night. And if the light conditions change, then slowly that response will change as well. So our biological clock is defined as the internal mechanism by which circadian rhythm is maintained in the absence of external stimuli. And it's that phytochrome we talked about that sets that clock, that sets that clock. All right, guys, that's it. Good job.